and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Let us pray. Father, we gather in from the busyness of this week, from all the comings and goings, to sit and to remember who you are. To remember that you are a God of justice and righteousness, a God of holiness. But yet you are a God that reaches out to us in the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name we come before you once again to sing and to pray and to open your word and to ask that you would speak to us. There is so much in these days, Father, that would make us lose heart, that would make us lose hope. But yet, when we are reminded of your goodness to us, when we are reminded of the ministry of your Spirit among us, Father, we see that there is no greater hope to be found. There is no greater strength to be gained. There is no greater purpose in life to be pursued. So as we approach this season of Lent, and as we think about the great sacrifices that you made in your Son, we ask that you would draw our eyes closer and closer to Christ. And as we look to him, Help our hearts to beat with a newness and a freshness and a life so that we would indeed go out into this world as those who know Jesus and make him known. The Jesus who came and taught and died and rose again to glory. The Jesus who prays for us right this very moment. As we are reminded of all of these things. How can, be, how can we not be reminded of our sin and the things that we bring today that make our relationship with you less than it ought to be? We thank you that you are gracious and slow to anger because if you were ungracious and quick to anger, where would that leave us? So forgive us, Father, for the things that we do that we really shouldn't do. We know we shouldn't do them, but we do them. The things that we say that perhaps we don't give enough thought or attention to that cause hurt or wound or present you in a way that ought not to be presented. And Father, just for all of the stuff, for all of the things that cling to us, we simply ask for your forgiveness and your inspiration and your power this day so that we could continue as those who would live for you. So Father, in the name of your Son and by the mysteries and powers of the Holy Spirit, we show our unity of faith, our unity of worship, our unity and fellowship by using those simple yet beautiful words that Jesus gave to his friends to his disciples when they talked about prayer together. Let us pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
we come to lift our voices once again to praise Almighty God with the words of number 446. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you about? Can you give me a wave? Let me see you. Where are you? Yes, brilliant. Good to see you all. It's great that we're here together at church to share and to think and to learn about God. So I've got something to show you this morning, and it's not a tricky one this time. It's fairly straightforward. What are these? Blocks. Mega blocks. And the reason why I bought mega blocks with me today is because. These are really easy to build. They're not like Lego, you know, the wee and awkward. Uh, mega blocks are mega. They're easy to build. So, if I wanted to build a very tall tower, is this just the way to do it? Just do, I just keep going. Yeah, do I just keep going. Well, what might happen if I just keep going? I'll not fall, will it? No, it won't. Try it again. Right, hold on. I just, I just need to, just need to make sure this goes on a wee bit better this time. Oh, oh! I see. I told you it wouldn't fall. Whoa. It's not going. Oh. Hold your windfall. Why did it fall? Any other reason? Yeah. Say that again. Couldn't do much with the side. What? Well, how could I stop that from happening? Go ahead, go ahead. Um, 
Thanks for that. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons why it fell down was because there was no foundation, was there? I just started building up on top. But what if I were to do something like this? You know, if I were to put a few blocks at the bottom, you know, like this, and then started to build on top of that, that wouldn't fall over just as easy, sure it wouldn't. Eventually, but not as easily. Is the point. All right. So it'll go up and it'll go up. And look, do you you see what I mean? I can get a lot higher, a lot easier. And it's not going to fall over. Why? Because of the foundation upon which it's built. Do you see how much sturdier that is compared to the last one I tried to build? And what I wanted to talk to you about today for a couple of minutes is that when we think of Jesus, we think of a lot of different things. Jesus is God's son. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the Lord of Lords. But he's also the King of Kings. And Jesus is coming and has come to build something. He's come to build a kingdom. A kingdom that would stand and endure. When we look in this world, what we see is a lot of people trying to do what we did at first. Building their lives on their own strength and on their own abilities and their own trying to be good. And what happens is for a while, yeah, that for a while that works. But it starts to get a bit wobbly and it starts to get a bit mm, not so strong. And then we saw what happened. Because when we try and build on our own strength and our own abilities to be good, that's kind of what happens. It falls. But if we build on what Jesus is doing, then we find ourselves strong. Because do you know where the kingdom of God starts, boys and girls and big boys and girls? It starts in our hearts. Jesus comes to live in our hearts and he starts to build the kingdom in there. And then we have a job and that is to go out into the world and to show people that kingdom so that they can know the kingdom of God in their hearts And the kingdom can extend and get bigger and bigger and bigger and go all the way around the world. So the building of the kingdom starts in our hearts. And it's not on our ability to be good. It's not on our strength. It's on Jesus and his work. So when we build on Jesus and on his work, when we trust in him and we ask him to give us the strength to build our lives, we find ourselves not like this, but like this able to go out into the world and to tell people and to show people what Jesus is like and how they too can be part of the kingdom that he is building, the king of kings. So, will we say a wee prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus is not just someone who came to teach about you, but he is your son. He is the prince of peace. He is the Lord of lords. He is the king of kings and he is building a kingdom that will last forever and ever and ever and ever and will never fall down. And we thank you that when we put our trust in him, he builds that kingdom in our hearts so we are part of it, so that we can go out and help other people to know about it, so that they too can be part of it and the kingdom will build and build and build and build and build to your glory. Help us to remember who Jesus is. Help us to remember that it is in his goodness and in his strength that we can live And help us to be those who live for your kingdom now and forever. Amen. Amen. So we're going to uh, sing again. And afterwards you can go out to Kids Home. um, And uh, our hymn is number 201. Let's stand and worship the Lord.
Good morning. morning. May I warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name to this service and pray that we would indeed know the presence of the Holy Spirit with us as we continue to worship. Just like to make the announcements that you see on the news sheet today and also to draw your attention to uh, one or two extra. First of all, can I invite you back to this evening at 6.30 p.m when we continue with our uh, monthly prayer and Bible study. Tonight we are going to be looking at the letter of First Timothy. And again, everyone is warmly invited to that. What normally happens at that meeting is that we spend a short time together praying. No one is asked to pray out loud or do anything like that uh, if they don't wish to. There's no pressure put on anybody. But we spend a short time to pray and then we have the study and then we'll have a cup of tea afterwards. Uh, and as I say, you're very welcome. But tonight, uh, the opening section of that meeting will be a time of special prayers for uh, the situation in the Ukraine. So of course we will remember other things as well, but we will be uh, deliberately, if you like, using that time to, to, to pay special attention to the situation that is ongoing in the Ukraine at present. So that's tonight at 6.30 p.m. Also, uh, last week, I announced to you the little book of 20 biblical characters, uh, six pounds each, raising money for the Asian church. Um, and I just want to mention it again uh, today. If anyone would like a copy, please speak to me. A, a few folk have already ordered one, and hopefully I'll be able to have them here for, for next Sunday. Um, it's important for me to mention today because if you remember I explained last week that it's a 20 little devotional profiles of characters in the Bible, some well known, some not well known, um, and I had the opportunity to write one of those little profiles for the book and I chose the prophet Joel who we're going to be talking about uh, today in the service. Uh, so I, how could I not mention that wee book today again um, with all the, the links uh, therein. So uh, that's uh, six pounds, and if you'd like to order one, uh, please let me know. Also, uh, if you order the Presbyterian Herald, they're available for you in the McIntyre suite today. After the service, if you'd like to stay uh, in the Allen Hall for uh, our coffee bar, please do so. Uh, remember to wear your face coverings when you're moving around the hall. Um, but other than that, please do stay and share in that time of fellowship and refreshment together. A PW will meet on Monday at 2.30 p.m. in the Barber Hall when Mr. Stuart Barber will be speaking his topic, Scared Witless. Um, and all are welcome to this uh, special um, mention of this meeting. Um, men and women, anyone can come along uh, to hear Stuart. So please, if you can do so, um, please make the effort to go along to that special meeting. The Zoom Bible study carries on tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. as we continue to explore the Gospel of Luke. And if you haven't had the opportunity to join in yet, you would be really welcome, so please do speak to me about that. Morning Watch will meet on Tuesday at quarter to 11 in the session room. Uh, next Lord's Day, we gather at 11 a.m. Uh, in the church for um, the next in the series of the Minor Prophets, the Prophet Amos, and then a welcome return of Cafe Connect uh, next Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. when we'll be thinking about mission. The next Youth Big Night will be on Saturday, the 26th of March. And again, as always, if any young people would like to come along to that, if they could let the, readers, uh, the, the, the leaders know in advance, that would be much appreciated. Just a couple of announcements I'd like to highlight. Um, and that is, of course, you'll see there the uh, message from our moderator, the Right Reverend Dr. David Bruce about Ukraine. Now, because of the fast moving situation that I'm sure we're all aware of, uh, what uh, David has written uh, to us in his message, if you like, is already out of date. Uh, the situation and the numbers involved and the people who have been displaced is just rapidly increasing. But the essence of what he has written um, is still very much the desire of our wider denomination to help in whatever way we can the situation as it unfolds there. There's lots of agencies and groups providing, um, if, if you like, practical assistance, sending out materials um, and resources and things like that. And PCI felt that there was no point overcooking the goose, if you like, uh, and trying to do that when that's already being done. 
but they have launched a special appeal um, to which you can give to, which would indeed uh, help to aid the situation and to provide the funds for resources and things uh, to be uh, collected and sent out and, um, and help raised. So initially, the, uh, the initially PCI are releasing 60,000 to be distributed equally between PCI relief partners. Um, and so if you would like to contribute to that, please do so this Sunday or over the next two following Sundays. And information about how you uh, might do that uh, is there in the news sheet. And I would imagine over the next uh, few weeks, more and more uh, information and updates will follow. Um, but if you would like to give uh, to the situation in Ukraine, the opportunity is there. Then I would just like to update you about the coronavirus situation. Um, and if you don't mind, uh, I'm just going to uh, read this short statement in the news sheet because it involves a number of changes rather than me trying to summarize them and forget something. So in Craiga, we wish to create a worship environment that is both safe and welcoming. While we would actively encourage all members to come to worship, believing it is safe to do so with the measures we have taken, we would also wish to highlight that no one should come to services if they have COVID symptoms. From next Sunday, the 13th of March, there will be no longer any mandatory social distancing, social distancing yet physical contact such as handshaking, etc., is still strongly discouraged. Please do respect others if they choose to continue to social distance and do not be offended if they ask you to give them space. Contact tracing will also cease. However, parents are asked to let Karen McCurry know if their children are attending Kids Zone. And the building can be entered and exited using either the church or McIntyre suite doors. It is still compulsory, unless exempt, for face coverings to be worn while entering, exiting, moving around the building or singing. All activities can begin again. So many of our activities have already restarted, but for those that have not yet had the opportunity, uh, they, they're free to do so now uh, as long as updated risk assessments are completed and those risk assessments pay special attention to the ongoing sanitizing of hands and the appropriate use of face coverings. These guidelines will be reviewed again on the 29th of March by PCI and further information I'm sure then will follow. So in many ways, folks, it's good news that we're moving forward. We're not quite there yet, but we are moving forward. And those updated guidance and guidelines are there for you to see. The last thing I would wish to highlight today, and apologies for so many announcements, but some Sundays are just like that, aren't they? Um, on the back of the news sheet, there's a little uh, letter that I have written uh, to uh, the congregation. And rather than me read every bit of it, I would like you to... Uh, take the opportunity to read it yourself. But the gist of the letter is that um, over the last number of weeks, uh, after a process of two years or so because of coronavirus, I am delighted to inform the congregation that I have been accepted as a chaplain within the Army Reserves. Now, just to highlight a few things regarding this, if you remember a few weeks ago, it said in the news sheet, that I had been commissioned as a chaplain within the Army Cadet Force. Um, that was in anticipating that being commissioned into the reserves wouldn't happen for a long, long, long time. Um, but all of a sudden things sped up and the situation changed. So it's very much regrettable that I'll no longer be able to offer services to the cadets because realistically committing to Craiga, the reserves and the cadets would simply be impossible. I want to say to the congregation, however, that my first priority is this congregation and my work with the reserves will not take away from that. One of the things that is uh, very important, I think, is to have an outlet, something away from congregational life. I've never been able to play golf. I don't even know how to hold a golf club. I've never really been fishing. I don't have hobbies that take up considerable time. And this is an opportunity for me to do something that I have a great passion for. Um, and I would hope and pray that with your support, it would enhance my ministry in Craiga rather than detract from it. 
typically the um, commitment would be um, maybe one night a fortnight, one weekend a month, which would not always include Sundays. And then sometime over the summer, um, where during my holiday I would go away uh, for training and for camp. Over the next couple of years, there are some training commitments that I need to do, but they're all drip-fed and they're all spread out. And I'm going to use a combination of my in-service training and my holidays to make that as less of a, of a burden uh, upon my work in Craig as possible. So I just wanted to kind of uh, put that out there and to let you know of the situation um, and what will happen there. But what I would say is, there are around 13 Army Reserve units in Northern Ireland, and they include all different things, and you'll see it there in the wee letter I've written. Around 2,000 individuals are part of the Army Reserve here in this province. Um, so this gives me a real opportunity to come alongside people who have no church connection or very tenuous church connection and maybe try um, my best in my own small way to show them a little bit of Jesus and to hope that that would grow in their hearts. As the old army chaplain Woodbine Willie always used to say, a chaplain's job is to pray with them sometimes, but to pray for them always. Uh, and I would ask that you would pray for me and for those who serve in the Army Reserve as I, as I start um, this, this work. So I just wanted to update you on that, but please, if you have any questions or concerns about that, I'm only too happy to chat to you about it, so please do come and, and speak to me at any time. We're going to turn now to, to God's Word, and as we come to open the Gospel of Matthew, we come to the Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. This is an event where the power and majesty of God is displayed in his Son, the Lord Jesus. Matthew chapter 17, starting at the first verse. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Then the disciples heard this. They fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Amen. And we thank God for his word.
As we come again to God's Word, we turn this time to the Old Testament, to the prophecy of Joel. I'm going to pick up in Joel chapter 2, starting at verse 12, and you'll find that on page 912 of the Pew Bible. Uh, Joel chapter 2, starting at verse 12. This is one of my favorite passages in the whole of Scripture, and it's a delight for me to read it to you this morning. Joel chapter 2, starting at verse 12. Even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow a trumpet in Zion, Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the altar and the temple porch. Let them say, spur your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Amen. Before we open the Word of God to explore it together, we're going to sing once again, this time with the words of number 622, praying as we sing that God would speak to us. Let us stand with 622.
One of the reasons why in the little book that I plugged today and last week that I wrote about the prophet Joel, one of the reasons why Joel chapter 2 verses 12 to 17 are my one of my favorite passages in the whole of scripture is because there's something very special about the little book called Joel. It's a book, I don't know if you've read it or if you've read it, it's maybe one of those books in a Bible reading plan that you get to and you, you read it because it's next on the list um, and you read it and you think, yeah, that, that, that's fine and you kind of park it there and it's not a book which really, really makes a massive impact. But actually, when you look underneath and when you really take the words of the prophet Joel to heart, you find that in this little tiny book, there is so much There is so much for us to grab hold of. And there is so much that in response actually grabs hold of us and transforms and changes us as we seek to follow Jesus. One of the reasons why there's so much going on in the book of Joel is because it is so full of quotations and links to other books in the Bible. This prophet, we don't know who he is. We don't know to whom he is related, we don't know. Maybe he was a priest. We know nothing about him other than we can kind of guess that he is in the southern kingdom because of some of the things he says. But we really don't know. But what we do know is when we read through his prophecy, we see quotations and links to Malachi, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Zephaniah, Nahum, Isaiah, Amos. We see someone who is steeped in the Bible and steeped in the work of God among the people. And he is writing this prophecy out of that depth of knowledge about the work of God. And he is desiring and longing for those who hear his prophecy to see the depth and the wonder of the work of God so that they too will be transformed by it and live in such a way that would impact and spread that knowledge and understanding of who God is so that this would continue and continue and build and build and build and see a kingdom coming that would put right the wrongs of a broken world. The prophet Joel longs to see God in his power and might act. And he longs for those who hear him to have that same longing. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, we read in Revelation. A desire and a longing for Jesus to come into a world that is so broken and so dark and so fractured and make it right. That's the same kind of passion and longing that we see in the book of Joel. A longing for what Joel calls the day of the Lord. A day when the Lord would come and see his kingdom built in all its fullness. How does he help people to grab hold of this idea? Well, he says the day of the Lord will be like, and he points back to the mighty things that God has done. And then he says the kingdom of God will be like that, but it will be even greater. And he points to a future vision where what God has done in the past and what God is doing now comes to its final and beautiful conclusion. But when we look to that, we see two things. First of all, we see that the day of the Lord points to the brokenness of the world and chiefly the sin in the world. One of the biggest problems that the world knows is sin. In fact, many would say that it is the problem and all the other problems in the world, if you like, are tied up with it. Joel doesn't point to a particular sin, not like where we were last week when we talked about sort of, uh, when we looked at Hosea, idolatry and all of that. Joel doesn't point to one particular sin or one particular big thing that the people of God are struggling with. It's assumed that they know. But what Joel does point to is that sin leads to destruction. Sin leads to the circumstances which would allow destruction to come. Sin leads to God disciplining his people. We read that in the New Testament again and again. And sin leads eventually to the coming of God's judgment. So sin leads to destruction. Sin leads to brokenness. And he shows two very vivid pictures as to how that looks. The coming of so many locusts that the very sun is blacked out. Locusts that eat everything in their path. 
or an army that advances that can scale the highest wall and defeat the strongest of opponents. The day of the Lord is the coming of the power of God that would tackle this sin, would tackle this corruption and would defeat it. So for those, if you like, who hear that and hear nothing else, the day of the Lord is something to be feared. The day of the Lord is something to not warm the heart, but to darken it further. But yet, what Joel says is that when we remember the character and the nature of God, we come to him in repentance and in faith, saying that in him there is life and restoration and hope and blessing, and there is the path out of this restri- out, out of these restrictions, path out of restrictions. I knew I was going to say that. Not path out of restrictions, path out of destruction and path out of coronavirus is just everywhere, isn't it? Path out of restrictions. Path out of that brokenness. That there's a way out. There's a way out. And that's why we see in this beautiful book two very compelling pictures. The first picture is Joel himself in chapter 2, personally repenting before the Lord. Personally coming before God and saying, Lord, I, I know sin in my own life. I know brokenness. I know weakness. I know I am not as you would have me being. And then there is that picture that I love so dearly where we see the community of faith coming together in repentance. So we have personal repentance, individual repentance, and then we have that repentance displayed as a community. Uh, Listen again to those words there uh, in the, the passage that I read. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people. And who are the people? Everybody, the children to the elder and everything in between. The young man, the young woman, everybody comes. And what do they do together? They cry out to God and they say, spur your people, O God. Do not let the world say, where is your God? Use us, change us, fashion us to be those who would live for your glory so that when people look for you and they see us, they see you. Don't let the people say, where is your God? Let them look to us and see you at your work within us. Use us to be a people who would shine the glory of your kingdom so that people would see you and people would know you and people would see your majesty and power and wonder and glory. Is that not such a powerful picture? These people gather together with a joint desire to say to God, God, we repent. Use us. We repent. Build us. We repent. Restore us. We repent. Lead us and guide us as your people. If only the church today in our part of the world would have that same passion for God to use them. And that same honesty about their failings and their sinfulness. Because sin is accepted. And a way of life that is indifferent to God is normal. But here the people come to their knees so that God would lift them and fill them. And that's why the second big picture of the day of the Lord. The first sin leading to destruction. The second is that the day of the Lord is the coming of the kingdom of blessing. So while sin leads to destruction, the coming of the kingdom leads to blessing for those who have come to that realization of who God truly and really is. Aristotle in the politics, writes about the power of the world and how the power of the world is really just a big clock face or a big circle. You have a group of people who can't really govern themselves. So somebody who is maybe quite intelligent, a bit of an operator, maybe has certain skills, rises to the top. They become effectively a dictator. 
then after a while the dictator dies or whatever and there's kind of a family or an aristocracy that develops and, and, and they rule things. Then after a while people rise up against them um, and sort of like democracy kind of develops and then eventually after a while that begins to fall into anarchy and then somebody who is very clever and maybe has good resources, maybe good at manipulating, they rise up and become a dictator and so on and so on and so on and so on. And power for Aristotle is just kept in this big circle and we're all at a certain point in the clock face. We're all at a certain point in the circle and that's it. That just carries on forever and that just carries on forever. That is not what we see in Scripture. What we see in Scripture is, yes, there's nothing new under heaven. Um, nothing has happened that hasn't happened before in some senses. But what we see is rather than a, than a circle that just carries on and carries on, we see a circle that is building, a circle that is slowly building up and slowly building up and slowly building up and slowly building up until eventually it breaks through the circle like a glass ceiling that smashes and there is something new and enduring. There is something that will stand forever. And that is the kingdom of God. If you like, another way to look at it is that we stand with a big bit of greaseproof paper up against the light. And as we look, we can see the light, but the greaseproof paper's in the way. And bit by bit, by the power and wonder of the Holy Spirit, with a pen, we put holes in the greaseproof paper and the light shines through. And after every hole and after every hole, and the holes get more and the holes get more, the holes get more until eventually the greaseproof paper is just tattered as the light shines through until eventually it falls apart. That is the power and majesty and wonder of God that is being displayed in Joel and throughout the scriptures. Not a cycle which just goes on forever, but a building and a building and a building and a building until things come to their final conclusion. A kingdom that will last forever. A kingdom where all will be right and all will be well. That's where Joel ends his prophecy. At the end of the book of Joel, he writes, in that day, the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of the Achaeans. That's our hope today, that by being honest with ourselves, seeing our need of God as individuals and as a community of faith, we would have that passion that Joel has to see the day of the Lord come bit by bit, building, 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 so that this broken and dark world could be made right. I suppose the last thing I would say, tying all this in, is we have a lot in this world today to be fearful of. I don't know if you've sat up late at night watching the news. I've tried not to, but last night for the first time in a while I did. And this world is a broken and frightening place. And people like Putin sit with so much power and authority, so much ability to wage war and destruction upon this world. But his power is only for a season. For the kingdom of God will endure beyond Putin and beyond the next person that sits in wherever he fits in in this Aristotle cycle of power or however it might look. We have hope beyond the darkness of this world. We have hope beyond the power and might of this world. We have hope that will last. And I think that's what the book of Joel helps us to see today. If we would come to God and say, don't let the world out there say, where is their God? Use us so when they look to us, they see you. And bit by bit, the light will shine. The kingdom will be built. As we say together, blow the trumpet and Craig it. Call a sacred assembly. Let us be those who say, you are our God. And we 
are your people. Will we pray? Let's pray. Father, help us to look into our own hearts and into our own circumstances. Help us to find again that passion and desire for you and for your kingdom. Help us to be part of this community of faith who lives out of that desire and passion, longing for you to come, longing for you to come bit by bit in our lives and longing for that day when you will come once and for all to bring it all together. But in the meantime, Father, help us to be the pin that leaves a hole in the grace-proof paper. And keep using us to pierce that paper again and again, to let your light shine. Help us to be part of this great kingdom work. Help us to be brothers and sisters in the name of your Son. For we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. As we approach the closing of our service this Lord's Day, we come to pray once again, this time praying for the world and for the church in this time of intercessory prayer. Let's unite our hearts to do that together. Abba Father, as we have thought already about that passion, and desire for you in this season of Lent. We are drawn to that story of Jesus and the transfiguration and how the glory of your son shone that the disciples fell to their knees in fear. But yet your son, our Lord, reached out to them and said, do not be afraid. He lifted them to their feet. And how in this world in which we live do we long to see those things said and understood? We long for the light of your Son to shine in the darkest of places and we long for people to hear his words, do not be afraid. That's why we pray for the people of the Ukraine just now where there is seemingly very little, if any, light at all, where there seems to be an abundance of fear and loss and grief. We pray that in the most unlikely of places and circumstances, that by the power and ministry of your Holy Spirit, they would see that light of Christ and they would hear his words, do not be afraid. That you would provide for those who are always caught up in these things. Those innocent civilians that just happen to be in the the wrong place at the wrong time. Those who are sheltering in their homes. Those who are fleeing to other places. Be with them. Bless them. Encourage them. Give them a strength that is not their own. And an ability to put one foot in front of the other. Father, we pray for those who would go to war with one another. We pray for soldiers on both sides of this conflict, many of whom have not gone to war with great malice or evil in their heart, but have gone to war because they've been ordered to do it, because they feel it's the right thing to do. Father, maybe some of them haven't even thought about it in any great detail. The circumstances are just right in front of them. We pray for them. We pray not knowing what to ask, But perhaps that the words of that hymn that we shared moments ago would be words that would stay in our hearts and in our minds. That we would pray for a world that would know peace. O God of love, O King of peace, make wars throughout the world to cease. The wrath of sinful man restrain. Give peace, O God, give peace again. We pray 
for those in government positions. We pray for President Zelensky and we pray for President Putin. We pray, Lord, that you would work in both of these men's hearts, both of them very different, both of them desiring different things. But Father, we pray that you would work in both of their hearts and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would do the impossible. Father, as we pray for all of these things, we pray for our own little world here in our own little province. We seem so small, do we not, in comparison to the big events of Russia and Ukraine. But yet here in our own wee home, we know the comings and goings of difficulty and struggle, of illness. We know the comings and goings of um, financial concerns with the rising energy prices. We know the comings and goings of broken relationships, of fear and loss. So we simply pray, again using the words of that hymn that we just sang. Whom shall we trust but you, O Lord? Where rest but on your faithful word. We pray that those whom we know and love would know you better and would find help and strength in you. We simply lift to you whatever else we have in our hearts and in our minds just now, whatever prayers we long for, whatever things we fear, whatever it might be, we present them to you and we ask that as we do so, again, we would think using the words of that hymn that where saints and angels dwell above, all hearts are one in holy love. Oh, bind us with that heavenly chain. Give peace, O oh God. Give peace again. Give peace to our hearts and peace to the hearts of those whom we pray for. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May I invite you to stand for the benediction. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be ours this day and indeed forevermore.